Welcome to the Rising Tide Podcast with D. Klein and Eric P. Rhodes. Each week, the Rising Tide Podcast brings you the latest stories from a world where art, technology, and culture converge. Ride the wave of the future with us. The tide is rising, and the possibilities are endless. Eric P. Rhodes. Yes, sir. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. So is this our uh, two-hour Farcaster special? Is that what's happening uh, here? I hope I hope so, because apparently <laughs> um, everybody's talking about Farcaster. Although the, the excitement's calmed a little, I'd say, over the last... Things move so fast in this space that, you know, you're talking like a matter of two, three days, um, and the story has completely changed. Like, for example... Uh, earlier this week, the Solana network froze for five mm-hmm. solid hours. No transactions, nothing happening on it. The old uh, on-off switch happened there, which you've joked about before. Yeah. And that seems like a long time ago now. And I think that was Tuesday, Monday. Yeah, so long ago that I launched something on Solana. <laughs> I know, you've come around. A lot of, um, well, we, could, we could talk about my thoughts about why I did that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, obviously we got to talk about Farcaster, Warpcast. Um, yeah, Ether Rocks. We have been, to talk yeah. about Ether Rock. I have that on mine too. Nice. All right. A crucial role in the development of NFTs. Fucking crucial. I didn't realize <laughs> that they were so crucial. I, I had no idea they were that crucial. <laughs> it's a good thing Sotheby's is here to educate us. Mm-hmm. Um, and okay. I've got to kind of do a little bit of an update on the whole Craig Wright versus Copa. Because they had their right, first, first week of court with a yeah. uh, courtroom that had no air conditioning in Australia in the summer in Australia. Must be brutal. But, or was it? No. Was it in Australia? Now I'm wondering. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But it was a hot space. So, uh, yeah. Check me on that. You know, you can fact check me on whether or not it was actually in Australia. I don't remember. And, yeah, I've got an interesting block as well. Yeah, I'm I'm going to just I think we should be blocked and I think that's going to be my block today because we are twinsies. Um and we this is completely unintentional. <laughs> uh, uh, someday we're going to meet up in New York and we're going to be like wearing like matching sweaters. Right. <laughs> I love NY. I have I have a uh I have oh my god, I look so young. It was back maybe 2007. Okay. And I have me holding an i love new york mug mm-hmm. with an i love new york shirt in like mm-hmm. this really stupid pose that i took when i was working in manhattan <laughs> well you gotta have it i mean if you're living in new york yeah well i mean you know for it's me it was ironic because i grew up there sure so i have this weird it's maybe this is too off topic i'll keep it short i have this weird thing whenever i go to a new place i buy a souvenir that's completely irrelevant to the location deliberately do tell well like so for example if you buy uh see where i live here probably banff is the most famous kind of tourist attraction the mountains Mm -hmm. and the ironic thing being any souvenir you buy in banff is generally manufactured in some other continent and then shipped here and then people buy it as a souvenir Mm -hmm. to celebrate their time here and so whenever I go uh, somewhere, consumerism. yeah, whenever I go somewhere, I deliberately purchase something that gives no indication whatsoever regarding the place from which I bought it. So for example, uh, when I was in uh, Quebec City, I bought uh, a shirt I liked at a, like a fashion store that's like Tokyo University or something. And it has, it's kind of a cool looking shirt. But it has absolutely zero to do with Quebec City. Just an example. Yeah, but basically it follows the same principle. Exactly. That's the yeah. point. Yeah, I love Nobody, it. It's, it's an inside joke only to me when I wear yeah. it. <laughs> the best inside joke. <laughs> so I have quite a few things that, that people are like, oh, that's a, you know, a nice hat or whatever. I'm like, yeah, I got this when I was in Las Vegas. You know, it's like, what? But it's Chinese. I'm like, I know. Cool, right? <laughs> You'll never, it's not going to be like some tchotchke Las Vegas uh, magnet no. on a fridge that was made in China. You legit got 
something with Chinese characters. You just <laughs> bypass the whole, uh, <laughs> the whole, the whole. What would I call it? The whole, not facade. Oh, I I used a good word this week. <laughs> veneer. Ah. The whole veneer. Yes. But and the thing is, in my mind, it still reminds me of the place. Yeah, right. Which is what the souvenir is supposed to do. Exactly. It doesn't remind anyone else, though. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And uh, let's see. Anything else we want to kind of do in our intro here in terms of what we're talking about? Or should we just get straight into Warpcast? Let's just get straight into it. Let's get straight into it because I feel like Farcaster. You've um, been going hard on it. You've already got like over 600 followers. Well, I had 400 prior to 450 prior to coming back onto the platform. So How, I, what I do went, you mean coming back? I, I've been on the platform since 2022. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And I, I went, I've gone, I've gone back and forth using it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until these two, until it didn't really come together for me until the uh, token gated chats, mm -hmm. which for me was like, okay, I don't want to manage a discord. Oh shit. Do you hear that? A little bit. That's my alarm. Oh, Listen. warning, warning. You need to warning. get up for the podcast recording. I don't. Did you hear that? Uh, very quiet. Sorry. Oh, it's a get the fuck out of bed, bitch. Go. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably get picked up in the recording. I just didn't hear it because I happened to oh, talk okay. at the same time. Anyway, this is this is what we do. <laughs> we're we're live unscripted. <laughs> Uh, so and anyway. unedited too, by the way. Because and unedited, I, which I appreciate. I don't want to do all the editing. Forget it. It's too much. Who work. does? Who does? <laughs> this is like doing a live podcast, yeah. except we just send it out a day later. Exactly. Yeah. So so not live, but unedited. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so anyway. you, were, you were talking about Warpcast, though, and you know I, what yeah. I notice is a lot of people get confused between Warpcast, Farcaster, Farcaster. My understanding is that's the protocol, and Warpcast Correct. is essentially like a DAP running on Farcaster. Yeah, it's a Farcaster owned client, essentially. Okay, so is it accurate to call it a DAP? Uh, essentially, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. technically, I guess it is. Yeah, I mean the way that I. It's sort of like um have you used have you used blue sky have you used Nostra, I signed up for blue sky mastodon. and then I didn't ever really use it I did use mastodon yeah So you know how mastodon has several clients that you sure. could sort of use sim similar concept All right So there's warpcast which is actually run by the Far I believe run it is run by the farcaster team Sure Then there's other clients like supercast which I've never used Mm -hmm. um and then i assume there are other clients but that just aren't as well known mm -hmm. um and so when i say client i mean basically it's an app that you yep. use to chat right like it as as the interface for the farcaster protocol right 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 i mean i guess so, at the end of the day it's, it's a decentralized platform so if you don't like what's well, you going broke on, up, on you went silent as oh. you moved away from the microphone ah, so what'd you say uh, essentially it's a decentralized platform farcaster is so if you don't like what's going on on Warpcast, go fire up another client, basically. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. And, you know, like I was saying before, the reason I came back to the platform was for three, really two and a half reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I like the, yeah, two and a half. How do you I half like the frames, it? right? Frames is basically, it's an in-app uh is think of it as iframes but for but for f the farcaster environment yeah, elaborate so little, a little bit. yeah basically like little programs that can be run in the client itself but ha are hosted on third party servers somewhere okay so essentially if you want to mint a token is that me essentially if you want to mint a token uh you could do it in the app one click mint your ethereum address is already connected to the client mm -hmm. so there's no there's no like having to sign well right. i guess you do start to sign the sign the transaction but you do it all in in the client nice and so feels more just, like a native experience yeah yeah hey bailey enough he was gonna bite the bed 
Uh, and then so the other thing that I chewing ASMR. Yeah. <laughs> more chewing ASMR for my dog Bailey. The other thing that I really enjoyed, like jumped back on uh, for, was uh, the token gated chats. Which for okay. me, somebody who just I I basically depreciated my Discord for se Second Realm because it was just too much for me to handle. Mm. Like all of these different uh, locations to manage my relationship with my my audience. I but could never get a handle on Discord. It always felt like too much to me. Yeah. If you're not, I think I did it pre prematurely. I think if you're a big enough artist and you have a like a team, good okay. for you. Yeah. And they can help you manage the server. Great. Yeah. But what the, in this particular case, with the token gated chat, it gives you essentially the basic core feature of Discord, which is a private server, private location mm -hmm. to chat with people with similar, like, you know, it, it, you're, if it's an artist, like you've all collected that artist's work. For okay. me, it's, you know, people who get the chat who've collected the, uh, the people's potato. Okay. You know? There's a hundred thousand of them out there. It isn't cost prohibitive, you know, um, ask a friend just to, you know, they'll give you one and then you can, and then follow me and I'll follow you. And then we could chat in a private, right. you know, chat that gives me discord flavor without all of the maintenance. Right. And it happens in one, one app. Yeah. Right. There's no switching. Right. So there's a lot of reduced friction, which is what is missing on Twitter, yes. especially in the Web3 space. And then the, the half was the uh, uh, the channels, right? Yeah, I knew yes. about the channels before, but the channels coupled with these two sort of friction reducing features for me added like a whole level of experience Okay, that was different than what you can get on Twitter or mm -hmm. Or uh, uh, what's the blue one? Blue sky, right? I guess what appealed to me immediately with it is there's just more real people there. <laughs> like, if you're yeah. on X or Twitter or whatever, you're just scrolling through just a minefield of garbage. And yeah, granted, there's plenty of content there that you won't find on Farcast or Warpcast at this point. Uh, but I feel like everybody I'm seeing on Warpcast is a real person that's saying something. Now, yeah, maybe there's... that's temporary. No, actually, I think it's a it's a feature of the way the the ecosystem works. Mm -hmm. Um, because you can break down channels for right. individual content, you don't have to create branded like uh like a like a branded twitter account that's separate right. from your regular account right? right we have a rising tide podcast mm -hmm, mm -hmm. channel we don't yeah. have to create a rising tide handle on on uh on farcaster so mm -hmm. i think that there's this like like brands become the channel you start to communicate in as opposed okay. to another entity as a username on the platform so sort of like brings back the human element which is the the really organic conversation that i get to have with yeah. real people oh and by the way thank you for uh sorting out that invitation i appreciate that for those listening oh uh, eric was so kind as to uh put up some warp tokens for me to join the platform without putting up the massive fee well, how much is it three dollars us and yeah. <laughs> and so i was like well i don't want to waste the offer right like three bucks who right. cares but you had already taken care of that for me and so i was like okay i don't want to waste it but the problem was my email had a period in it like such and such dot such and such and for that reason it didn't recognize it and so when i put in my email without the dot then it recognized it and boom, it instantly worked. So thanks to yeah. you, Eric, and thanks to uh, the Farcaster folks that helped you because I believe you reached out to somebody. Was the name Akash or something like that? Yeah, but I didn't even reach out to them. This is uh -huh. this is why I love that like somebody reached out to them who I didn't know, tagged okay. them in my in my public cast. Okay. 
uh, and then within like minutes, they reached out to me, asked me what the email address was, told me that I invited you, but without the dot. Uh huh. And like fixed, right? With I mean, it was hours, but um, it's a weird know. thing with Gmail because it doesn't really recognize dots, but it sort of kind of does in certain contexts, you know. So, mm. um, yeah. Anyone else there that's having trouble with an invitation with a dot in your email? That's probably the reason why. Yeah, yeah. So it was, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm glad you were, like, you and somebody else were the two people that I thought like I got to get them on who didn't already have accounts. You know, yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, it's refreshing, you know, like it's oh. granted, it doesn't have some of the things that you have on X. I mean, it's a different platform. It's to get different features. Um, yeah. it may, I believe it's running on the Ethel 2 base. Is that correct? Optimum. It's on Optimum. OK, why do I? Which keep... is which is an L2 built on top of Ethereum. Yes, yeah, sure. Why do I get the feeling like it's a base? operated platform i see a no, lot of base, uh, base is it. also built with built on optimal okay okay that's the confusion i'm having about it yeah all right i've kind of got them jumbled in my head yeah so farcast is built on optimum base is built on optimum all right all right all right that makes yeah okay yeah. i'm getting them jumbled yeah you know like it's a whole new it's a whole new language mm -hmm. you know you have to you have to sort of like sift through uh, but it's not that difficult once you sort of sit there for a few minutes and sort of like visualize the layout. Right. I don't know. Just experiencing it. It makes me realize, you know, L2 is legit. Like L2 is a legitimate scaling solution, like in terms of the performance of it, you yeah. know, it's, it's nice. It's seamless. You know, like if there's an update to it, it has a little thing at the top of the app that says, Hey, start restart this app. Boom. You hit that a couple of seconds. It's restarted with the updates. Like it's pretty slick. Yeah. I mean, the benefit to L2 is cheap gas. Of course. Right? And, and, and speed. Right. Yeah. And speed. And so a platform like this is, is, like what I think an L2 is built for. I Absolutely. in the past I in one of our previous sort of podcasts, I told you I hadn't really like paid attention to L2s, but that was purely from a like minting my art perspective. Right. Yeah. That's you know? different different scenario though. Yeah. 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 This I'm like love it. I love it for many reasons. The the organic conversation, the real people, the it is it's hyper niche right it's like it's techie for us it's crypto centric um but that's who's buying my art yeah right like so yeah. it makes sense for me to now it didn't before but like these community features really make sense for me as an artist where this is where my audience is this audience to be on that platform again well, you may have a slightly smaller audience, at least initially, but you've got 99% yeah. less noise. Oh, my, so much less noise. And, yeah. like, good quality conversation. And here's the other thing. I feel more comfortable sharing different parts of my life on Farcaster than I do on Twitter. And it's not because, like, I don't want to do that. It's because the my Twitter handle, Second Realm, is so branded for just crypto art. Ah, uh, I see. Right, but e my 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 Solana, my Solana, my <laughs> Farcaster, Warpcast, right? Because there's the channels. I have a Second Realm channel where I could publish all of my art related stuff to. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Rising Tide channel where we park at where we could publish all of the podcast related content too but then there's channels all over the place like books and jobs and and these are just you know two off the top of my head um i could post things about books that i'm interested in right right it feels more social than for me than 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 twitter does right now right well, and again, I think that comes back to me to the feeling that the people that are seeing it are authentic people. Yeah, so they are. But and also people are 
I think because there's so much noise on mm-hmm. Twitter and there's a lot of stale follower account. My, I think my, yes. I have a lot of stale followers sure. on, on my Twitter account that yeah it's it's a sm- i have a smaller follower account here but i'm having more engagement and and i don't mean like engagement from a from a monetization perspective but it's like engagement from a human to human perspective they're active followers yeah yeah and yeah. like you know i'm good good conversation and like mm-hmm. people are there willing to help and it honestly feels like and I, you know i say this with hesitation it feels like 2019 when i started to act like participate in crypto art twitter well because you got this little community there where everybody sort of yeah. knows each other right yeah so it's, it's a nice feeling it's that cheers everybody knows but we're all name, learning really. together too yeah so i uh, cut you off go ahead say what you're know. gonna say i was just saying it's kind of like the you know where everybody knows your name cheers song mm. you know it's that feeling like you're at home with a group of people or something but go on yeah, so no, I don't remember what I was going to say, but I've I've been watching. I'm going to deviate real quick. I've been watching some of our older, older like episode one through five. <laughs> it was way back six from like yeah, three weeks way ago. Way back. <laughs> um, and I recognize that I have a I have a habit of like getting excited and talking over you, so I'm like oh, trying to pay attention to not do that here. I did. I talked over you in the first couple episodes because I was using these terrible little earbuds that I didn't hear half the things you said. <laughs> I'd be like, I think he's done talking. <laughs> <laughs> we're figuring it out, folks. Live, live in, live and in color. We're figuring oh, it out. Shoot. Yeah. Speaking of interviewing, did you uh, catch this uh, Tucker Carlson Vladimir Putin interview? No. <laughs> no. Why would I? <laughs> I got to say, though, like, and I mean, this wasn't really meant to be a topic today, but I did see one ex post about the numbers for it. Okay. Oh, I bet it got great numbers. This was a post by Benny Johnson. I don't know who that is, but anyway, I saw this post and it says, on average per night, Fox has 1.85 million views. MSNBC has 1.22 million views. CNN has 582,000 views. In less than 24 hours, Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin already had 141 million views. <laughs> like, now, whatever you think of this Tucker Carlson interview, I always thought it was kind of amusing that he's like, I'm the only one bothering to interview Putin. It's like, no, Putin's declined to have interviews with other journalists. <laughs> so, yeah. nice spin, but it's not true. Yeah. Also, um, you're not affiliated with any major network. So... <laughs> Right. So, you know, it's a lot of self-promotion there. Um, and uh, I mean, it's right, a not good to get, get, but but, but and, and it's a good get uh, the whole thing. From what I could tell when I was uh, I watched the beginning of the interview uh, first and he's like, just starts asking about Ukraine. And Putin says something like, well, let me take 30 seconds to a minute to explain the history behind this. And then he goes on a half hour history lesson literally after saying 30 seconds to a minute about yeah. the origins of Russia and how Ukraine belongs to Russia. It's like, what a pile of BS. But anyway, uh, Tucker just throws him all these softball questions and just lets him talk for like half hour at a time. It's not really journalism. Like it's basically here. Yeah. Let me just be your platform to deliver yeah, this without crazy. any criticism. Right. Yeah. Like, so it, was, anyway. it wasn't a hard hitting. It wasn't, Tucker Carlson was never going to go hard hitting no. in Russia on on Vladimir Putin. This was purely <laughs> about clickbait and numbers. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is it, for him personal victory, though, because there is a clip of Fox News where in the top corner it says courtesy of the Tucker Carlson network and has an image of Tucker interviewing Putin. Right. It's like, I guess Tucker won this round. Right. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Right. But what I'm getting at is, you know, obviously, you know, you can tell what I think about uh, this interview. Um, What I'm getting at is you could make a pretty strong argument that mainstream news as a product is toast. It has been for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, look, a guy like Joe Rogan would have been would have had his own television show. 
Sure. Would it would have been a talking head on you know some network, right? But for the last 10 years he's been delivering his own content or yep. maybe even longer, right? So yeah, it's toast. The the creator economy essentially the freedom to be able to publish your own content using the internet sort of changed the paradigm forever. Yep. You know, and so they're hanging you know, on. Yep. For that, you know, it does show the power of, you know, the independent approach. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, I do sometimes wonder about that because, you know, like, for example, there was a thing a little while ago where Joe Rogan was talking about Canada and how meta owners of Facebook and Instagram were censoring Canadian news, but they didn't say Meta was censoring it. They said the Canadian government was censoring it. Right. Yeah, you got, got it wrong. Which was total BS and completely wrong. Uh, the Canadian government said, no, you've got to pay some of the proceeds that you're getting off of all these small Canadian news outlets. Um, and Meta is like, no, screw you. We're not paying them. So we're just not right. going to show any Canadian news on our platforms. That's not government censorship. But the problem is you get a guy like Joe Rogan with millions of followers saying, oh, Canadian government censoring news. Nobody's going to check corrections on that, right? Like that's where you think about the X, like the, you know, how you can be a, you can throw in a community note. Nobody's going to read that community note that after Joe Rogan, Rogan says that and go, oh, actually it's not met, uh, the government censoring it. It's meta, yeah. right? They're just going to say, yeah. oh, government sucks. Yeah, well, whatever fits their narrative, right? But most people will do that anyway, look for confirmation bias. Not most people. I will say people who are apt to just find content that fits their narrative. Yeah. They're going to find it no matter where they look. Anyway, I didn't no, want to get too political, but. I, it's okay. We, we we seem to be going sometime. We, we, we always seem to go in this direction. <laughs> I think it's related. Here's yeah. why I think it's related. Okay. Right regulation is a part of our space sure right and regulation is highly political mm -hmm. so of course i think you know it's part of what we need to be talking about when it's you know well and i mean you can't really get too far into bitcoin or crypto in general without it getting political oh. even among the community sure you know and i mean frankly it's meant to be political yeah, it was it was a yeah, totally. Yeah. You want to talk uh Solana freezing for five hours and your conversion to a Solana art release? I wanna hear yeah, this. Sure. I, want to hear, I want to hear first of all, so I think it was Monday, maybe Tuesday, that the network froze completely dead for five hours and then they had to restart the network. Yeah, they finally plugged the servers back in. <laughs> yeah. Somebody flipped it back on. <laughs> a computer nerd, Dave Ramsey would say. Some computer control, nerd flipped control, it back alt, on. Delete. Yeah. <laughs> alt F4. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I'm curious about your conversion, though. Your Damascus, yeah. Dam Dam Road to Damascus event. Yeah. So, a um, little bit of a exploration in technology rather than using solana itself right it's on solana mm -hmm. but the the draw for me was two twofold one um well for those that don't know i literally just dropped today so today is we're recording it's it's saturday you'll hear this on monday so it'll have already dropped um foma mag which is run by sasha bailey launched something called foma uh art 2.0 uh -huh. and it's an exploration and a new way to think about nfts or a different way to think about nfts so each nft that you mint also comes with tokens associated with it like uh -huh. fungible tokens like think erc20 but on solana's chain and so you can what once you you buy the NFT, you get the tokens as well, and you could trade the tokens, a percentage of the tokens. 
you don't have to trade the whole NFT if hmm. you wanted to. And the idea is every time that you trade tokens, there's it's deflationary. So every time you break it down, 4% of the tokens are, are um, burned. Is this so that ERC-404 thing? Is that what that says? Similar, yeah, except okay. it's on on Solana, it's token... Oh, of course, this is Solana, yeah. Yeah, it's token two, 2022. Yep. So very, it's very similar. Like fungible yep. and non-fungible kind exactly, of combined. Exactly, exactly. And that was what... Schrodinger's uh, token. What's that? Schrodinger's token. It's fungible and non-fungible token. at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've explored with... with I've explored the idea of uh, NF, like an NFT becoming a fungible pseudo currency, like when I minted one billion potatoes, right? right? Essentially, it was an ERC eleven fifty five minted one billion times, and as a result of that, I minted it. It wasn't like minted by other people. I minted it. It's essentially a pseudo currency. So there's mm-hmm. this fungibility aspect. This is in twenty twenty. So there's this fungibility aspect, this pseudo currency aspect to the people's potato. Um, it was one of the reasons that it won it, it won an NFT award and was nominated for one, right? So for me, this seemed like a really cool way to sort of explore fungibility and NFTs again. I have no idea if this is going to go anywhere. That mm-hmm. I wasn't really concerned with like selling wasn't really the thing that I was aiming for. Those sales would be nice. It's like, I wanted to see what minting an NFT that has tokens associated with it. And there's this deflationary aspect to it, what that would look like in and happen in the real world, you know, in a real world situation Mm -hmm. or in a DeFi situation. Um, So that's why I chose to do it. For that reason, and because of Sasha and FOMA, I'm a big fan of Sasha Bailey, big fan of FOMA Mag, um, and it seemed like the right the right partnership to do it with somebody. They minted it, uh, and and I'm just basically gaining the benefits of exploring this technology. Yeah, FOMA Mag is legit. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Very cool. Um, and so you don't personally like you're not involved in the process of having this go out then you were just contributing to it as an artist correct okay that's cool yeah, yeah. that's the way uh, to do it eric it is yeah so one you get of the to be things... the artist and the artist alone <laughs> yeah and so one of the, one of the one of the things that also attracted me to it was this year i was looking to do more collaborations mm. with people um i've been going at it one you know, by myself for mostly four years. And what I mean by myself is like, I haven't really collaborated with platforms. I haven't really collaborated with galleries to launch stuff. Mm -hmm. And so this year I was going to, like I I made a personal goal to try and do some collaborations. Like I I tend to move too fast. Like I see something, I want to go do it. And right. when you're working with galleries and working with other people and other projects, um, there's like this ramp up, right? There's the art and the mark, and and I don't, my brain doesn't always work like that. So, but this thing with uh, with Sasha and Foma, like it happened so fast, I loved it because it fit my sort of ADD brain of like, boom, 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 do boom. it now, yeah, and you know, and so it's a good experiment for multiple reasons. It's I get to explore Solana. I get to explore this fungibility, uh, semi fungibility aspect of trading art, you know, and with DeFi, uh, and I get to partner with a friend and right. support his project. And like, I love that. That's like, that's why I joined the space. One of the reasons I joined the space in the first place was to find my people. Sure. And he's one of my people. So I'll support my friends. It's awesome. Yeah, no, I think, you know what? I've dabbled in Solana minting on it and uh, I haven't seen a lot of activity there because it's not my audience at all. Uh, but it's yeah. still fun to just try out things on different networks and see how they work and see what the options are and be a part of that excitement. 
Yeah, I didn't know about so the four hundred four. You mentioned four hundred four. I didn't know that existed until I was on Farcaster. Like, there's so okay. much content in this space uh, that's easy for me to just miss. Yeah, well, yeah. and it's not and I, like it. Uh, it doesn't have a standard yet or anything. Like, it's yeah, right. So yeah, it's still pretty. And it's weird. It's a weird name, four hundred four. Like, yeah. why would you name it after the error? Like the error code. I don't know if websites. that's a play on it. I don't know. Is it? Like it doesn't even make know. sense to me, and it doesn't follow like the it's ERC four hundred four with no dash, you know. Is that right? Like okay, yeah, it's you know like ERC dash twenty, ERC dash. Is that maybe because it's not standardized as of yet? No, I don't. That's just what they. I believe that's like the way that they chose to write it out. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I don't. There's think probably it, some reasoning behind it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not nerdy enough to know yet. And one of the things that um, I'm really terrible at, which I realized in this conversation, is I'm talking about all of the tech itself mm. and like why I why I wanted to do this with FOMA and like the fungibility. I didn't even talk about the artwork itself, which I called Soulless, <laughs> which is a play on Soul for Solana. Did you make it from um, AI? Huh? I did make it from AI. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Which is also, yeah, which is like this, the relationship <laughs> to our previous conversation, yes. right? Really? And, um, and, and the reason I, I made it and called it, so, so basically it's like, there's this skull and the skull is surrounded by, um, black and black and white sort of blockchain esque blocks right mm -hmm. but coming out of the skull like it would fire like you'd see fire coming out of the back of the skull is like color into these blocks okay. there are secret hidden it's not all ai there are secret hidden messages in the artwork itself that if you zoom in and find in certain places mm -hmm. you can see it mm -hmm. but the reason i called it solus was i thought it was funny that people would be buying and selling this to this nft called uh Solus, and in a way they they could like because they could break it up right they'd be selling their soul essentially uh-huh they sell their soul to me for this soulless token or the, yeah they 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 use their soul they give it yeah they sell their soul to me for this soulless token and then they could break it up i just thought it was like this fun way to play with the medium itself yeah it reminds you know? me of you remember the world of warcraft south park episode no oh it's classic there's this nerd who you know is basically ruining the game and they're trying to find a way to conquer him but they're like how can you defeat one that has no life yeah the joke being he's you know living in his basement and he has no life but you know so anyway no it just reminds me of that yeah no. uh funny so no, it's, that's it was... that's a cool play on it i like that yeah and you know it's totally tied into the what we've been talking about about the soul you know like uh the soullessness of ai art and mm -hmm. so it felt really relevant and tied like almost like multi-layer conceptual out concept conceptualization concept yeah i was gonna say conceptuality but i don't think that that's a real word so it's like a multi-layer right? conceptualization. Yes. That's it. Of of like what's happening in real time in my life. It's kind of right? meta. Yeah. It is it's and it was meant to be meta and what happens with a lot of my artwork is the meta gets lost. So this is an opportunity for me to It's sort of like share an that. embracing of the the absurd. It's embracing the thing about it that's, you know, in some way uh Missing. the nonsense yeah it's interesting yeah yeah i love it i so kind of experimented like... when ai art was new and i never actually minted any of these i experimented with a whole bunch of just hands ai art and just because it would really struggle at the time with making hands look it right. does and i made a whole collection of just weird awkward hands uh stuff i've kept them but i've never minted them they were fun because you would just you could put in just descriptions of hands doing different things and you would get the most ridiculous awkward 
hand designs. So I think it's interesting about that is AI has gotten so much better. So it's yeah. harder to sort of make those, make those, I don't want to call them awful hands, but like bad hands, mm -hmm. you know, AI, bad AI hands. But that, it was charming you know, in its, in its flawed nature. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my point. Like the fact that you have these, these pieces, right? People, it's harder to replicate that now. Yeah. To me, it like, it was a personification of the AI, like almost as if the AI was like trying to listen to you and figure out what you were saying and just mm -hmm. really struggling with it. What, how do you feel about like, um, do you use AI in other aspects of your life? Not really. I've used chat GPT on occasions just for ideas for like, for example, because I do have a phys ed class and it's a huge mm. class, 65 kids because there's two classes wow. in there. And so I've, I have done, oh, what's a fun game that all 60 kids can play, blah, blah, blah. And it comes up with suggestions. Unfortunately, they're almost all suggestions of things that I've already done. So <laughs> it wasn't as useful as I hoped for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a bummer. Yeah. But, you know. Um, it'll be like, you could do capture the flag. It's like, you think I haven't thought of capture the flag before. Right. <laughs> right. Maybe we right. should play lawn darts. Do you remember? <laughs> but with kids running around. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> like growing up. We had the most dangerous toys. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we played with like metal lawn darts, throwing them up and trying to run out of the way. Well, and that, the irony being people will always say, and we were fine. It's like, yeah, except for people who weren't fine, and they're not here to tell you that they were fine. Right. <laughs> right. Speaking of people telling you they're not here, uh, terrible, terrible transition into ether rocks. Um, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, speaking of soulless entities. Th soulless. Oh. <laughs> oh, that is so much better. <laughs> Speaking of yeah, soulless, speaking of soulless entities, entities uh, Sotheby's Metaverse announced yeah. the Ether Rock. Uh, what is it? Some kind of special auction? Crucial. They, that Ether Rock, Ether Rocks played a crucial role in shaping the NFT movement. They which, certainly did. You know, basically, following CryptoPunks' next Ether Rocks, like that's that's their view on the hierarchy of influential NFTs. I don't know how to say his last name. But the guy who runs the the NFT ver the N the Web three wing of Sotheby's, is it Michael Boannon? I don't know. I just thought it was funny. I mean, it's, there's no doubt they Whoops. got they got plenty of attention, and it was kind of you know this funny like pet rock play. Yeah, let's 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 play devil's advocate with with Sotheby's here. Well, let me sure. play devil's advocate with Sotheby's here. What's their job? Their job is to sell things and make commission. Sure. Ether rocks, whether this, you know, whether we like it or not, have weird high value that people want to buy. And sure. Sotheby's sees that opportunity. And, and if I was running a business and can sell a digital image that's you know in the creative commons for three hundred thousand dollars why wouldn't i why wouldn't i do that right well and the reality is there is some self-awareness here with these ether rocks they were made as a joke on the pet rock thing and they were made to play with that concept mm -hmm. in the nft space and people seem to forget that that was an intentional thing yeah yeah well number numbers go up Right. And so that's what that's what really drew people to Ether Rocks though, was mm -hmm. archaeologists found them and all of a sudden they were this early NFT project. And their value, for me at least, is that they were dug up to use these rocks were dug up and and there's been this narrative around them that they're an early project and like that is what is winning the story here. Well, yeah. I have to admit, if I had an original Ether Rock, I'd be like, check it out. <laughs> check I would have sold a long time ago. Right. <laughs> yeah, I would have. Yeah. I mean, I sold my ex copy. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not a great collector. 
that's what, <laughs> that's what that lesson is. As long as you took a profit. I need. I had to pay bills. Yeah, it was yep. the one that was airdropped to. It was Po apps that were airdropped to early collectors and buyers on Super Rare that were there before 2020. I missed a lot of those good airdrops. Yeah. 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 I only sold it for one ETH, and you know, sadly, but I had to pay bills. Like you know, yeah. it's all it. relative. Yeah. Yeah. So Sotheby's here. A lot of people are complaining. Um, specifically about the way that Sotheby's marketed the rocks, calling, like you said, calling them a crucial aspect of NFT cult, NFT, the NFT, I the NFT exactly. movement, shaping yeah. the NFT movement. But it was using the word crucial, both Jimmy ETH and a lot of other people, sort of, you know, aren't known. We, they all play, you know, played with this in their own unique person personality ways. Jimmy, of course, goes after it. Um, calls them out for for like for what what you know basically is I think awful you you know what would we call it um it doesn't matter like insincere start, you mean it's it is it's totally insincere mm -hmm. it's clearly what it's not authentic at all mm -hmm. yeah and I think that that's it's shilling. One hundred percent. Which is like, I mean, if you really like strip away the veneer of the whole space in these instances, it is about the shill. It's well, it's their the job. Story. <laughs> yeah, which is what I was saying earlier too. Like, I feel the cognitive dissonance here inside my brain. Like, in on one side, I'm like, it's they're an auction house, that's their job. And the mm -hmm. other side, I'm like, yeah, but like, get the history right. You know, um, and these two things sort of rub, you know, rub each other. And and I think in this space, it's difficult to for some people to sort of find that balance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have a problem with it. I mean, they're marketing something that they want to have success at an auction. I see that, yeah. And I mean, it is kind of iconic of the early NFT movement, arguably. It became iconic in 2021. Right. Before that, nobody gave a flying You're right. Fuck. It was a look yeah. back. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Nothing again, like, again, the archaeologists, because of the excitement of the NFT space, they got to look back. Yeah. And it's like, that's part of like the story here, too. And it, in a good way is a lot of the early projects got unearthed um, and, and brought back into the light. Think of pride punks and mm -hmm. um, ether rocks is like two of like two that really come to mind. I think for most people, um, I think it's good in a way. I mean, that's the I value think... prop of this stuff is that you can look back easily. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that cognitive dissonance, I'm like, get the story right. But yeah, I want to see this success happen because I hope that one day some archaeologist is like Eric Rhodes art, blah, 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 you know, half a million dollars. You know what I mean? Like, I hope that yeah. happens. I mean, to say that they were influential, I guess that's where there's an issue there because were they really any influence whatsoever on the yeah, movement? Uh, I, I Look, um, again, I'll play devil's advocate. I argue, yeah, they were influential in the number go up, excitement of like early nfts when the archaeologists were digging through and i say archaeologists because i think that's a funny name that they gave themselves why archaeologists and not historian hmm. you know where you maybe you were i don't know again um yeah today i can't seem to find my words um I am both excited and frustrated at the same time that that we're seeing a lot of interest in the space. I just I think a lot of artists wish it was interest in their work. Sure, like I was about to say, hey, like I'm kind of dissing Sotheby's here, making fun of them, but at the same time, if Sotheby's ever had work of mine, I'd be like absolutely proud and thrilled and yeah, 
you know, I'd be telling everybody. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, just right. funny that, you know, it, it got that much attention, I think. But I mean, like you said, it was a number go up. It was, a it was uh something it was a talk of the town in 2021 where it was like can you believe these rocks are selling for 200 grand or whatever they were selling for yeah and think right? about like all the derivatives that came from it and mm -hmm. that's that's part of the fun culture cultural aspect that i think is being missed here too totally um yeah are we ready for blocked yeah yeah i think so let's do it oh i have to <laughs> Let me take a drink. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. Let's try this again. Multiple takes. Yeah, multiple takes. Take two. <laughs> and just like that, you've been blocked. That was one of the best ones you've ever done. <laughs> terrible. That laugh was Absolutely great. Absolutely terrible. <laughs> uh who's first you first <laughs> okay uh i thought this was funny uh i was looking at uh there's a post from jason williams you might know who that is jason a williams going parabolic yeah. on x mm -hmm. and uh he noticed that dave ramsey the uh financial advisor i kind of foreshadowed this earlier in the episode i mentioned his name um <clears throat> dave ramsey's team this is what Jason A. Williams wrote on X. Dave Ramsey's team is scrubbing all of his comments on Bitcoin because he led his followers to absolute wrecked city by funding the asset class that has now been backed by all of his puppet masters. Um, basically, this was probably about a year ago, right when the FTX crash happened and Bitcoin went down to like 15 grand. Then, of course, Dave Ramsey was like, see... I told you, you shouldn't invest in this stupid stuff. If you have Bitcoin, you're stupid. Uh, he literally was quoted saying, what if a computer nerd flipped a switch and turned off the Bitcoin computer? Poof, it would be gone. That's a word for word quote from Dave Ramsey. Mm. So here's a guy who, now I'll give Dave Ramsey some credit. You know, he, if you've ever seen any of his content, there is a lot of good advice he gives, you know, like yeah, I've reality read, is- I've read of a few of his books. Yeah, the reality is the vast majority of Americans and Canadians don't know how to manage their money. They have too much debt and they go into more debt in the hopes that somehow magically they're going to get bailed out by some get rich quick scheme like Bitcoin. And when in reality, they'd be better off just getting rid of their debt and having a more disciplined financial lifestyle. And then if you've got some money to spend on things and you want to buy Bitcoin, so be it. Go ahead and be stupid, but don't put yourself into debt for this stuff. And I think in that regard, he's right. If he just uh, left it at that. If he just left it at that. But he just, first of all, unlike somebody like Peter Schiff, who's used, uh, you know, dissing Bitcoin as a way to farm engagement, mm -hmm. Dave Ramsey just plain doesn't know what he's talking about with Bitcoin. He talks about it being stupid, but he has no understanding of it, which is obvious from some of his quotes. Um, so as much as I think plenty of his financial advice was actually pretty sound, he doesn't know what he's talking about on Bitcoin. And therefore I don't think he should talk about it at all. And it seems like his team agrees because they've erased every comment he ever made about it from his, from his, uh, posts. So just like that, Dave Ramsey, you're blocked. <laughs> just like that. You've been blocked. Nice. How about you, Eric? I'm going to block me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Interesting. I'm going to block myself um, for flip-flopping on Solana. <laughs> um, all in the name of, you know, good fun, of course. So, um, yeah, it just... I feel like I owe it to, I owe it to everybody to call out the ridiculousness and mm -hmm. the flip floppiness of of my words, and just like that, Eric, <laughs> and just like that, you've been blocked by yourself. That's awesome. I actually had uh, one other topic I wanted to talk about briefly was the whole Copa huh. versus uh, Fake Toshi trial. Yeah. 
and Dude, this was the first good. week of it. Now, again, I don't remember where it's taking place, and I'm sorry I didn't check during the episode either. I don't. We don't have like a guy like Joe Rogan on the sideline looking up stuff for us while we talk. So, um, <laughs> no, I could look it up for us. <laughs> so it's interesting because after these days of uh, cross examination with fake Toshi, um, basically Copa's strategy has been to just rev- show how much of his stuff has been forged and how much of it is just fraudulent and. Um, his defense has been comically bad to it. Um, basically towards the end of the week, he was essentially admitting that these documents had been tampered with, but his way of wriggling himself out, it was to say he was hacked. Um, people were embedding stuff in his documents when he was looking the other way. Um, there were other people tampering with this stuff and that the way he had it originally is the real thing. And now you can mean this is supposedly a guy who is a security expert. The number of times his stuff's been compromised is yeah. according to him is completely ludicrous. So that's not meant to really be a blocked cause I already did that, but uh, Let's or block not. his ass anyway. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> and just like that fake Toshi, you've been blocked. <laughs> Anyway, I can't wait to see what happens here because he's pretty much, from what I've read, pretty pr- pretty much admitted to having tampered with some of these docs. And that gets into perjury territory. So yeah. well, I feel like a lot some of his strategy was to get the like to use the le- the use the legal system to somehow finagle a way for them to like say that he was fake he was satoshi by you know i don't know uh it it if he settled right if he settled and said right wasn't that wasn't that something we talked about we can just cut this cuz this is crap no don't worry we're not editing this eric this is unedited fuck See, this is what, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens when, when Eric is unprepared. Um, well, he went so I'm far sorry. as to waive his privilege on some of the, on some of his uh, supposedly private, previously privileged uh, conversations with his own legal team. He waived his privilege to a number of topics, which is like, that's terrible strategy. Because that opens him up to attack to all of that. What was client uh, attorney privilege? You now mm. can actually look at that stuff and critique it. So I don't know what he's thinking other than that he's just flustered and uh, seeing that things are unraveling. He's desperate, right? He's desperate to prove something. I love it. I love that he's <laughs> floundering. It's great. Yeah. So it- Fake Toshi, um, you know, what's his name? Craig. Craig, you want to say it? I was trying to get him to say it. (laughs) Fake Toshi, (sighs) Mr. Craig Wright, sir. Um, Good luck. That's all I got to say. I don't know, man. I mean, I can't see how he gets out of this one. I... Where where are these? Is this happening in the U.S. or the U.K.? Well, that's the thing. That's what I couldn't remember, and now I am going to look it up. If, forgive the keyboard. Uh, the Saki. That's what they call it, Faki. Uh, it's. I think it's in London, according to this. Mm. So, interesting that it's very very hot in this courtroom this time of year in London. Which is why I thought it must have been in Australia. So, <clears throat> yeah, I just I don't see it ending well for him. I don't see how the 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 crazy explanations he's been giving for stuff just doesn't add up. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't really pay attention to him other than other than when we talk about like the case. Mm-hmm. For me, he's a non-entity now. I don't. I find it entertaining. So yeah, 
You want to hear something entertaining that's not related to Bitcoin? Sure. My dog got sprayed with a skunk two days ago. Oh, no. And tomato sauce? Did you have to give him a tomato sauce bath? No. We we bathed him, and it got in the ceiling because he... So the, the bathroom oh, okay. stunk. Um, we bathed them and then put some, like, baking soda peroxide and dawn mixture together wow to wash it off uh, but maybe i should have blocked my dog because this is what my dog did <laughs> okay my dog <laughs> runs outside at seven o'clock in the morning as he often does i skunks are typically nocturnal this guy it was kind of like sun out maybe he was going to bed i don't know uh-huh. but my guy instead of barking at him goes to run up and sniff its ass. And what do you think happens? Right in the face, he got fucking sprayed. And thank God it was just his face because the rest of his body didn't get didn't get like oh, skunked. But man, it was <laughs> awful. It still is in certain like his when it's been rainy a little bit. Uh-huh. So when he gets wet, rinsed off. When he gets wet, it sort of like lingers. Oh, so I see. My, yeah, my dog needs to be blocked too. <laughs> Awful. Oh man, so you blocked yourself and your dog. Yeah, it's been a rough week. <laughs> rough, get it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that note. <laughs> yeah. Right on, Eric. Well, thanks for the chat. It was fun. Yeah, as always. It's a good chat. Awesome. Have a great week. Peace, you too.